Kent Beck from Gusto here, talking today about a study that I've begun into software design. I figured I've been doing it for 40 years. It was time I understood a little bit about what was going on. And as always happens at the beginning of a study, I realize that there's a lot that I know in my gut that I can't articulate. So I started writing things down. And the first thing that came out of my pen was a shock to me. I wrote, software design is an exercise in human relationships. And I thought, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to write about coupling and cohesion and power law distributions and things like that, not, not about human relationships. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized, yeah, the essence of software design, the things that make it really hard are human factors, not necessarily the technical things that I'm much more comfortable dealing with. So in today's presentation, I'll tell you about uh, the two most important human relationships in software design. And then I'll give you an experiment that you can run to help you uh, improve the relationships that, uh, that you have in your teams around software design. So I'm going to divide the world into two kinds of people. The first kind of people use some software. They might want to see its behavior change, but they can't actually enact those changes themselves. And I'll call those people waiters. Contrast that to people who can make the changes to the behavior, and I'll call them changers. And it's this relationship between waiters and changers that's the first of those two relationships I was talking about that makes software design such a challenge. The, uh, the problem is not in the long run. In the long run, everybody wants to see the system change and evolve. And they like it to happen as quickly as possible, but no more quickly. In the short run, though, the, uh, the incentives of waiters and changers can diverge significantly. And that's because the pictures that they have of software development are so different. So uh, here at some level, software development is a sequence of ideas that turn into behavior changes in the software that spark more ideas, that more behavior changes. And this is the cycle that goes on and on. And both parties see this cycle in the same way. They see this flow of uh, behavior changes as the software evolves. Beneath the surface, though, there's another set of changes going on. The changers know that the structure of the system dramatically affects the cost of making behavior changes. And so uh, some of the investment in development goes into changes to the structure. But those changes to the structure aren't visible to the waiters. And here's where we have the, the conflict in the relationship. Uh, there's a, a couple of classic uh, dysfunctions. W one is where uh, uh, the changes of the behavior take all the precedence. And so the structure gets worse and worse. And then eventually it becomes impossible to make changes to the behavior. And then, like, whose fault is that? And uh, you used to be able to make these kind of changes in an instant, and now it takes you weeks, and that doesn't work out well. Uh, but too much investment in structure, or too much investment, especially at the wrong time, is also damaging to the relationship. So if we go and make the perfect structure, this is the classic second system syndrome, we're going to make all these uh, investments in the structure of the system so we get it right this time. The behavior of the system uh, doesn't change. The waiters are getting impatient. And there's no end to the uh, amount of investment you can make in the structure, especially if you've just been through that first dysfunction where you know that if you don't get it right now, you'll never get it right. And so we have this divergence of incentives between uh, waiters and changers. And uh, maintaining that relationship is critical to software development 
and software design can play a part in that. We have to find some way to balance the needs of the two parties, to balance the investment in structure and in behavior, to sequence that so that everybody gets as much of their needs met as possible for as long as possible. The second set of relationships are relationships that changers have to other changers. Say I want to change some uh, API that you call uh, inside the system. We're both changers, but the work that I do affects the work that you do. My relationship with you is really important. If I go and make breaking changes to the API and I say, oh, it's your problem to go and, and uh, update to the new version, then uh, you're not going to be really happy with me because you've got behavior changes to go and implement and you don't have time for my shenanigans. So maintaining those relationships changer to changer is also uh, important and difficult and challenging. So there we have it. This is two of the fundamental relationships that make software design uh, difficult between waiters and changers and between changers and changers. So what can we do about it? Let me set up the experiment for you. There are, I've observed, uh, four stages to um, software design enlightenment, I'll call it. Although maybe enlightenment's too strong a word. You tell me when we're done. In the beginning, when you're just starting to program and you can get programs working, all you do is you make a bunch of changes to the system. You don't really even have a sense of, of uh, you're just making changes. You're in the middle of some if statement and you decide a variable has the wrong name and you change the variable name and then you finish the if statement. And So it's just a bunch of changes and when there's a clop of those changes, you, you take that out. That's level one. Then somebody gives you a copy of uh, Martin Fowler's refactoring book and you realize there's two flavors to these changes. There are the structural changes, the refactorings, and the behavioral changes. And they are fundamentally different. And in fact, you shouldn't mix them. You should wear one hat at a time. I'm changing the structure. Now I'm changing the behavior. Now I'm changing the structure. So you're, if you're in the middle of changing an if statement, you wouldn't then suddenly start changing the names of variables. You wait until you're finished with the if statement, then start changing variable names, and then go and add another case, and back and forth and back and forth. So that's level two, when you just become aware of the difference between structure and behavior changes. Level three is where you start playing chess where you think, ah, I'm going to make this structure change so that this behavior change is easier to implement. Or you say, well, I'm going to change the behavior, which is going to make the structure a little bit uglier. So then I'm going to have to make some structure changes when I'm finished. And now you're thinking a few moves ahead in time. You're sequencing what you're doing. And this is where you get into... Uh, the phrase that I coined for it is uh, make easy, uh, make the change easy, poof, then make the easy change. Uh, where you're not just, uh, the changes you make are, are not just differentiated because, differentiated because there's behavior and structure changes, but you're deliberately deciding what order to, to do them in to make your work as a developer easier. And if you haven't started doing that, I recommend that you give that a try. You know, sometimes software development feels like it's just really, really hard. And the, uh, the more experience I get, the more I realize, you know, it, it, if it's hard, that's a sign that I'm doing something wrong sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's just genuinely hard. But sometimes I need to make my work easy and feel good about the easy work that results. So the experiment, though, that I'm going to suggest to you is that once you learn to sequence behavior and structure changes, you start dividing up 
the changes that you make into little tiny pull requests. That is, I make a little change to the behavior and then that goes to production. And then I make a few changes to the structure and then those go to production before I make the next change. And some more structure and some more behavior. That every one of these little bits of code leaves you with a system that's running and uh, valid and works. And any given PR only contains structure changes or behavior changes, but you never mix the two. And that's because structure changes are reversible. If I extract a helper method and then we decide, no, we don't want to do that, you just inline it and away you go. Hopefully you have tools to help you with that, but even if you don't, you can do it manually and it's not terrible. Behavior changes tend to be irreversible. So if as a gusto, we, uh, we f accidentally file a bunch of uh, uh, wrong tax reports. That's not something that you can just get revert. It's, it, it's, there's permanent consequences out there. So as a reviewer, looking at behavior changes, you need to know, well, what are the test cases and what's the backup plan and so on. But structure changes assuming they're going in a reasonable direction, don't require the same level of scrutiny. So there's the experiment to try to divide your PRs up into much smaller PRs, which either change the behavior of the system or the structure of the system. Now, sometimes that means that you're going to change the behavior in a different order than you would. Uh, that is, uh, you might, like the keystone in an arch, you might make the uh, changes to the user interface uh, at the very end of a project, as opposed to maybe you, if you're just developing and you're going to have a one big PR, you'd change the user interface whenever you felt like it. In this style, uh, with these smaller diffs, uh, you would make that change to the user visible changes to the behavior at the very end of this long sequence but there might be tens or hundreds of PRs leading up to it that make that final change really small and simple. And the change of the system as a whole it isn't large when you do that. So how does that relate to these relationships that we we're talking about? Uh, a big uh, cost in the relationship is a variance of delay. So, I gave you that example of you used to be able to do this in a day and now it takes you a month. The, uh, this style where you have a sequence of behavior and structure changes gives you many, many more options as a changer to move behavior earlier in the sequence or if you, if you need it to deliver val visible value to a waiter or you can move it later in the sequence if there's no urgency and some structure changes would be, would be valuable long-term for the system. By dividing your PRs up into the sequence of either behavior or structure changes, you have many, many more options to make sure that the waiters are always getting a, a steady flow of what it is that they want. As a changer, you, you can then... Um, be a better partner to them. And the same is true for the changer to changer relationships. If I'm going to change an API, I if I care about our relationship, I might start the new API, implement it in terms of the old API, and then go and help you to call this new API. When all the migrations have happened, then I can remove the old one. That's a uh, and then I can change the behavior to whatever I wanted to do. So I've taken what would have been one atomic change and I've broken up into parts. And I've done that not for technical reasons, but because I care about my relationship as a changer with other changers. Just as I broke up behavior changes into smaller bits because I as a changer care about my relationship with waiters. 
So there you have it. There's lots of good refactoring you can do. There's uh, lots of coupling and cohesion that's, that explains uh, how this all, all works and why it works and so on. But I wanna leave you with that one insight took me a long time to figure it out, that software design is an exercise in human relationships, but that we as technologists have many tools at our disposal to do a better job of maintaining our part of those relationships. Thank you very much. I hope you're staying safe.